Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to be part of this post-COVID effort. <laughs> I think we have to keep up uh, the good work and have these face-to-face uh, -face meetings wherever we can. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And to those who are joining us online, good morning, <laughs> good afternoon, or if you're in Australia, good eye, because I think it's probably in the middle of the night. Uh, anyway, a very warm welcome to everyone. The first time I came to the Royal Institution, I was sitting uh, up there somewhere, as many decades ago, it was during the time when, when George Porter was the director, so that uh, dates me. Uh, and the subject of the lecture was the arrow of time, why the past is different from the future. Uh, and the reason I was interested in that was because I'd done my PhD on that very topic at University College London, and so I wanted to hear, I think it was actually George himself who gave the lecture, I wanted to hear what he, he had to say. Uh, and uh, I uh, came across this um, quotation from Michael Faraday, uh, which I think, uh, and of course his ghost stalks the corridors of this building, I think uh, it was addressed to me because uh, no matter what you look at, if you look at it closely enough, you're involved in the entire universe. And indeed I had found that the source of time's arrow can be traced back to the origin of the universe. So uh, these are very appropriate words. Uh, well, these days, as you heard, uh, I live in Arizona, but it's a delight to be back here in London, uh, away from the unrelenting blue sky and warm sunshine. <laughs> blue sky does have one advantage in Arizona. Uh, it's good for astronomy. And in fact, in some ways, Arizona is the world capital of astronomy. There are many observatories. But it's also the place where the subject of cosmology began. Now, cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole, as opposed to astronomy, that astronomers study bits and pieces. Cosmologists study the big picture, the whole thing. And uh, we can trace the origins of cosmology back to Arizona, and in particular back to an observatory that was built at the turn of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, by a rich businessman, Percival Lowell uh, in Flagstaff, which is a three-hour drive north of um, Phoenix, where I live and work. And uh, the reason that Lowell built this observatory was not to study the grand architecture of the universe, it was to look for Martians. Uh, that um, At that particular time, there was a lot of speculation that Mars was inhabited by intelligent beings who dug canals. And, uh, the search for the canals on Mars seemed to be a high priority among those who uh, believed all this. And Lowell himself produced uh, these elaborate maps of the Martian canals. And it turns out that they are entirely a fiction of his imagination. Uh, he was convinced that there were intelligent beings there. Uh, but then when NASA launched two spacecraft to Mars called Viking, uh, this is what they found, uh, a freeze-dried desert. Uh, with withering ultraviolet radiation, uh, no sign of any life and no sign of any canals. And so uh, that was a sort of wasted venture. But the uh, observatory itself had other projects, lesser, I mean, on smaller telescopes. And one of these uh, was uh, a little-known astronomer called Vesto Slipher, uh, who decided that he was going to investigate uh, what at that time was one of the great unsolved problems of the universe, which is how it's organized. Now, uh, astronomers were familiar with the fact that there were fuzzy patches of light. They were called nebulae, still are called nebulae. Um, uh, but uh, what were they? Were these uh, simply clouds of gas within the Milky Way, or were they like other Milky Ways uh, much further out? And uh, how was this going to be resolved? Well, uh, Slipher, and, and I should point out that in those days, ast an astronomer's lot was not a happy one because uh, Flagstaff's very cold in the winter, gets lots of snow. Uh, that's the best time to look at the stars. Uh, and you can imagine, and you can't heat an observatory because the air currents mess everything up. Uh, and so it's freezing cold work. And it's not like today when it's all hooked up to computers and they do all the work and you sit somewhere warm 
uh, and just download all the images. Uh, in those days, it all had to be done with painstaking toil, uh, the, uh, sl photographic slides, literally, e exposing the, the plates and developing them, uh, and uh, uh, basically tweaking the instruments as you went along. And so this was a, an astonishing and painstaking uh, uh, endeavor. And so, basically, uh, what, he, what you, he was looking at were things like this, fuzzy. I mean, it's, a, it's not the projector, it's <laughs> deliberately defocused, because that's what you saw with the early telescopes. But what he was able to do by analyzing the quality of the light using a spectroscope, uh, he found that the fainter of these nebulae uh, were redder than the less faint ones. And there seemed to be a systematic relationship. And he had an explanation for why they might be red. It's called the Doppler shift. If an object is rushing away from us, then the light from it is stretched out and it's shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And that was known. Uh, so it's known as the red shift. So he discovered that the faint and therefore farther away objects, uh, he surmised, were um, rushing away from us faster. And this work came to the attention of uh, Edwin Hubble, a pipe-smoking lawyer turned astronomer, uh, who had a much better telescope, the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope. And he was able to look more closely at these nebulae and to, to see that they were made up of individual stars. And not only that, he was able to use some of those stars to measure the distances to them. Uh, and uh, settled the matter that, uh, the, that many of these nebulae are, in fact, other Milky Ways, other galaxies, as we would now call them, uh, millions of, of light years away. Uh, but uh, he took Slipher's results and uh, added to them and produced uh, this rather dubious looking graph, but it's sort of trying to be a straight line uh, based upon these observations. And what this suggested to Hubble is that. Uh, if, it's, if there is that linear relationship, it suggests that the whole universe is expanding, uh, getting bigger all the time uh, in that type of linear relationship. And he published those results in, of all places, the New York Times. Uh, this was in uh, 1924. Uh, that was the first uh, the world heard of it. Um, and you, you might have thought that a declaration that the universe is expanding would be uh, a, a media sensation around the world, uh, but it really wasn't, although Hubble became quite famous. Uh, but the thing is, nobody quite knew what to make of all this. Uh, today, uh, we think the expanding universe is part of what I think everybody, everybody knows. Every school child knows that the universe is expanding. Uh, but what, what does it mean? Expanding into what? Coming from where? What is its trajectory? Uh, how do we think about it? Uh, and the first thing that is pretty obvious is if the universe is getting bigger every day, it must have been smaller yesterday than it is today. Uh, and then if you run the great cosmic movie backward uh, and you go back some billions of years, because Hubble could measure roughly how fast it was expanding, and it was sort of billion-year timescale. If you go back billions of years, uh, then surely everything was scrunched together, uh, that uh, it must have sort of come into existence somehow. Uh, and uh, what could you say about that? Well, uh, in the 1920s, nobody really wanted to be drawn. Well, almost nobody wanted to be drawn. Um, but one person who did draw the obvious conclusion was uh, a Belgian priest, uh, the Abbe Georges Lemaitre, uh, who in 1927 uh, sort of said the obvious thing, that if everything is coming out of this uh, tiny volume, uh, then uh, he... He had this term, cosmic egg. He imagined that in the beginning, not literally an egg, but uh, that's why I'm uh, depicting it that way, uh, but that it exploded uh, and gave rise to the universe we now see. Um, it uh, wasn't very well received. Einstein said, your mathematics is correct, but your physics is abominable. Uh, and uh, at the time, almost all astronomers said, well, this was a speculation too far. So uh, the idea that the expanding universe implies uh, an origin at some finite moment in the past, a few billions of years ago, uh, really uh, took, a, took a back seat to other uh, issues in astronomy, such as what makes the stars shine. 
Uh, and if we fast forward to the post-war years, uh, then uh, an arch uh, skeptic of this idea of this sort of abrupt cosmic origin was the astronomer Fred Hoyle, the Cambridge astronomer Fred, Fred Hoyle. Now, Fred, uh, with a couple of others, had developed another way of thinking about the universe. He, uh, Fred, of course, realized it was expanding, but did that mean it had an origin? No, not necessarily. He said, supposing every time uh, the universe doubles in size, then uh, new matter, uh, equivalent to what was there before, uh, trickles in to the, to the universe and fills up the gaps left as the universe expands. And I should just say as a corollary, because people often say, well, you know, how, what does the expanding universe mean? The best way of thinking about it is it's the expansion of space itself. Uh, so every day, the universe has, uh, somewhere in the book I've worked it out, uh, how many more you know, gallons or liters or whatever is your favorite uh, unit of space appear in the universe every day. So the reason that the galaxies are retreating from us is not because they're all blasted from some common center over there, it's because the whole universe is, the, the, the space is getting bigger and bigger and bigger everywhere, and so therefore the galaxies are conveyed apart from each other. There's no center and no edge. Uh, so you have to think of it that way. Um, and so Fred had this idea that there was no beginning to the universe and no end, but it was in a steady state, uh, that uh, uh, over billions of years it would look more or less the same on a large scale. And so this is a way of depicting that um, with the new matter coming in and new galaxies forming and so on. And that was taken very seriously in the 1950s. Uh, the steady state theory is a rival uh, of the cosmic origin theory, and it was Fred in a radio, BBC radio interview uh, that coined the term Big Bang, and it was a term of derision. He said, uh, well, some astronomers think that the universe began with a Big Bang. You know, that's self-evidently absurd. Uh, and the name stuck, and that's what we call it today, the Big Bang theory. Now, the nail in the coffin of the steady state theory came a little bit later in 1964 with this extraordinary contraption, uh, this uh, was uh, an, a radio antenna built at uh, Bell Labs in New Jersey, and it was built with the intention of communicating by satellite. I'm probably the oldest person here. I can well remember Telstra, the first communication satellite uh, in the early 60s uh, that was able to uh, uh, certainly send te tele telephone signals. I'm just trying to remember whether that was when we got the first TV signals from the United States. It was uh, very memorable. Anyway, so this was the pinnacle technology in those days. I mean, look at it. Uh, and uh, what they found was that there was an annoying hiss in this instrument, uh, and there was some, a lot of effort to try and figure out what it was. Could it be pigeons nesting inside the antenna? So they cleared the pigeons out. wasn't that. Um, but they eventually realized that this hiss was coming from outer space, and it is, in fact, the fading afterglow of the Big Bang. This is the Big Bang's smoking gun. Uh, the, this radiation, the, because the universe was very compressed at the beginning, it was also very hot, and this radiation has nowhere to go. It fills the whole universe, but as the universe expands, it cools down. Remember I told you space is stretching, so that what that means is that light waves traveling through space uh, get stretched as they go, and that's how you think of the redshift. And uh, th this radiation has been stretched by a factor of about a thousand from the time that it was uh, last in equilibrium with the matter when the universe was a sort of fiery plasma at about 380,000 years after the beginning. That sounds like a long time, but it's a tiny fraction of what we now know is a 13.8 billion year old universe. And so this radiation is coming untrammeled, almost undisturbed from that very early time. And today we can observe it with satellites, and if you do that, this is a textbook spectrum. So this is uh, the heat radiation, the spectrum of the radiation, that is the energy uh, distributed across different wavelengths. And this is, uh, when I was at school, you saw this curve, because this was deduced in the 19th century, that if you had a perfectly uh, uh, a perfect black body or a, per a system which was in perfect thermodynamic equilibrium, it should have a radiation spectrum that looks like this. And this is the, this is the, the real thing. It's the best example we have. You can't get this good in the lab. Uh, so uh, it was pretty obvious, I think, to everybody in the late 60s 
that the universe did have a beginning with a Big Bang, uh, and, uh, and, and Fred w surrounded himself with a heroic band of die-hard steady statesers, statespersons, um, and, uh, and here's a, a, a picture from 1970 uh, with Fred Hoyle. This was the Institute of Theoretical Astronomy in Cambridge, uh, with Fred Hoyle uh, sitting in the front row there, still tenaciously clinging to those ideas. Uh, and you might also recognize in the front row a very young-looking Stephen Hawking and a very young-looking Martin Rees. Uh, and if you look very carefully at the back, you'll see a very young-looking Paul Davies. <laughs> uh, and so the reason I'm belaboring this story about Fred Hall is because he gave me my first job, and there I am on the job, standing at the back, uh, about to embark on my career in cosmology, and uh, what a charmed career that has been, because I've lived through the golden age of cosmology, uh, which really began uh, not with Slipher uh, or Hubble, it really began with the cosmic background radiation, the CMB we often call it, the cosmic microwave background, which carries so much information etched in the details of that radiation are uh, inf is information about the first split second of the universe, and it was obviously at that time going to dominate cosmology uh, for the coming decades. So cosmology uh, at, uh, in the, about 1970 was really a backwater of science, a speculative backwater. It's now precision science, and a great deal of that comes from investigating that heat radiation. Now, already at that time, uh, of course, there was a lot of discussion. If the Big Bang was real, everybody wanted to know, well, what caused the Big Bang and what happened before it? Uh, and people still ask those questions. If I go to dinner parties, and I usually try to keep quiet about what I do, but if, it, if cosmology comes into the conversation, people always pounce on me. Uh, Aha, you scientists may be clever, but what happened before the Big Bang? You know, that's got you stumped. Uh, so let's, uh, let me just address that question, because uh, it's an important question. I'm not shrugging it aside at all. Uh, and we don't know the answer, but let me tell you, take you through the concepts. Now, uh, what does it mean, anyway, uh, what happened before the Big Bang? So a simple uh, version of the nature of space and time might be something like this. Uh, time stretching back for all eternity, forever and ever into the past, and then some particular moment C, for creation, if you like, uh, the universe comes into being. Okay, so there's nothing down here, and then, boom, there's a universe, physical existence. Uh, is, that, is, that, is that the case? Why would, why would that happen? Obvious problems with it. Uh, what calls C? I was just uh, saying that. What calls the Big Bang? doesn't have to be a Big Bang, whatever it is, what, what caused it. Seem to be only two sorts of answers, a natural process or a supernatural process. Uh, if it's a physical process or something like God uh, to make that happen. But both of these have their problems because if it was a physical process, what type of physical process needs all of eternity and then it suddenly happens? If it can happen with a finite probability, why didn't it happen an infinite time ago? So that's a very strange thing to think of it as a physical process. Um, but it's equally strange in theology because uh, uh, you, you can ask, uh, or people did ask back in the early days uh, of the, uh, the narrative of a, of a universe having an origin or a creation, uh, what was God doing before creating the universe if the time goes on for infinity. And Augustine in the 5th century, he was a, a, a Christian theologian, uh, came up with a clever answer to this. Uh, he said... Uh, that the world was made with time and not in time. In other words, that before what we would now call the Big Bang, uh, there was nothing at all, I, and I don't mean empty space sitting there for all eternity. I mean no space, no time, no matter, no thing. So literally nothing. And that was Augustine's view. Uh, and so the, the idea being that time itself just sort of switched on at this particular event. And that's pretty much the way it was when I was in Cambridge at that, that time. The standard view of the universe was there was a Big Bang and it was the origin of space and time. And so the question about 
what happened before the Big Bang, or what caused the Big Bang, uh, was simply dismissed as meaningless. Uh, Stephen Hawking, I think, later expressed it quite well by saying, asking what comes before the Big Bang is like asking what lies north of the North Pole. The answer is nothing, not because there's some mysterious land of nothing there, but because there ain't no such place as north of the North Pole. And in the same way, in this simple picture of a Big Bang, uh, there's no, no such time as before the Big Bang. Uh, so this is my pathetic attempt to depict this. Uh, so here we see the uh, great eruption, the bringing into being of the universe. Very misleading because we don't think it has an edge. But anyway, and here we see time, uh, the clock itself, coming into being. Um, but the idea that uh, time would just sort of switch on, you know, there, there wasn't time and it, it appeared, uh, does appear a little bit magical. Uh, so although... Uh, you can't talk about a cause, you can still ask for an explanation. Why would that happen? How could that happen? And there's one branch of physics that gives a clue to how we might explain that, uh, and that is quantum mechanics, quantum physics. And in the 1980s, uh, Jim Hartle and Stephen Hawking uh, worked uh, on a theory that had the universe with a quantum origin. Now, let me explain to you in simple terms, why that could work. So imagine that you have an excited atom, and as most of you probably know, the atom can then decay or de-excite and emit a photon. It's a simple process, uh, and that's described by quantum mechanics. So this is a process where in the beginning is no photon, and then there is a photon. And according to our best understanding of quantum mechanics, you can't predict exactly when that will happen, that the process is intrinsically uncertain and indeterministic. And so if you say, oh, the photon appeared at 4 o'clock on a Thursday, but why didn't it appear at 2 o'clock on a Wednesday, um, there is no answer to that. So in other words, quantum mechanics is a description of the world that physicists favor uh, that says that there are genuinely spontaneous processes down at the atomic level. So the reasoning is, if the universe was once so squashed to the size of an atom, then quantum effects would have been important. And we could talk about the spontaneous or abrupt coming into being of a universe from nothing via a quantum process without having to worry about a cause. And so that was the drift of it. Um, it was called the no boundary proposal because uh, I don't want to get into too many technical details, but you'll notice that what uh, is depicted here is uh, space in the horizontal plane and time going vertically. And this is you know, the universe. We're only showing two sp uh, space dimensions. Uh, and then it's a bowl-shaped thing. And so if you think about this being time, what this really says is that down here, there's only space. And up here, there's space and time. And that the time itself, uh, it doesn't switch on abruptly. It sort of emerges out of space. And uh, again, this is my attempt to, uh, to, to show you this. So imagine that the origin of the universe is like that. So time doesn't just uh, suddenly switch on. It emerges. Uh, it takes a duration to emerge, if you like. I mean, that's an abuse of language. And what I just showed you is speeded up about that number of times. Uh, so, um, so it would have been, uh, uh, to, for, for most purposes, we could regard it as instantaneous. So was this credible? Was it credible that the origin of the universe could be explained uh, as a quantum event? Um, well, I think there is some evidence in its favor, and I'm going to now pick up the main narrative, which is the exploring this cosmic background, uh, microwave background radiation, because um, Penzias and Wilson, who discovered the, you know, with the horn-shaped antenna, uh, couldn't really map the whole thing properly, but the first satellite to do it, called Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE, um, uh, many years later, was able to uh, produce a heat map of the whole sky. And here it is. Uh, it was published in the early 90s and became instantly famous. And what you're seeing there in those color-coded blobs is slight variations in temperature. This is the whole sky sort of mapped out there. So these blobs are big in, in size 
but very tiny in temperature variation, few parts in a million. Um, and um, the, uh, but the overwhelming story is not the variation, it's the smoothness, that the temperature over there and the temperature over there in the sky are almost exactly the same to a very high degree of precision, once you factor out that the Earth is sort of plowing through all this stuff. Uh, and th so those variations uh, were very important. Now, um, today, there's a much better satellite uh, called Planck, uh, and, and that's what we see now. So very detailed data mining of that uh, radiation. Now, um, I, I uh, had a small part to play in all this because uh, in the 1970s, I uh, was a lecturer at King's College in London, not far from here, and I had a student, uh, Tim Bunch, uh, and we needed to get him a PhD. And so uh, we were, at that time, uh, there was a group of us, we were interested in quantum effects in the expanding universe. So getting close to what I've just been talking about. Um, and uh, there's a particular, the equations are really difficult, but there's a particular one where they're easy, and that's where the universe doubles in size in a fixed time. So it's exponential expansion. And then uh, you can solve the equations. I mean, it was still a lot of work for Tim, and he, but he got his PhD, he solved all that. Um, and what we were interested in was the... Uh, the quantum vacuum, that even empty space, we know in quantum mechanics, is uh, not totally empty, but it still has uh, activity with particles that uh, come into existence fleetingly and then disappear again. I'll come back to this a little later. Uh, but just know for now that even if you remove all atoms and all photons and all particles from a box, uh, there's still things happening in that box, and there is a certain amount of energy that attaches uh, to, to what's happening there. Uh, and this being quantum mechanics, there's uncertainty and indeterminism and uh, fluctuations. So any given quantity fluctuates. Um, and so we'd worked out the properties of that quantum vacuum, never thinking that anybody would ever be remotely interested. And it was only two or three years later that suddenly uh, a new theory of the Big Bang appeared, and it was called the inflationary theory. Uh, and in a nutshell, uh, what that theory says is that during the first split second after the Big Bang, the universe uh, leapt in size by an enormous factor, as if it had taken a sudden deep breath. Uh, and that um, that was a fundamentally quantum process. And when it stopped and continued expanding at a more sedate rate, uh, then the quantum fluctuations that Tim and I had worked out were imprinted on the universe, so sort of writ large uh, in the sky. And, and that's actually what you're seeing there. That we think these are uh, the uh, fossils of quantum fluctuations uh, from the first split second uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, so very strongly suggesting a quantum origin. But like everything else in cosmology, it may be superseded. It remains the best explanation. Uh, quite some decades later, uh, and it's more than just, you know, looks right. Uh, statistically, it does come out right, uh, and people have done these analyses. I'm not going to go into the technicalities here, but what you see is the, um, with the curves, is the theoretical prediction based on this vacuum state that Tim and I worked out, um, and then uh, the red dots are the observational points, and you'll see that it, uh, it does come out very well. And that's a good, because without these quantum fluctuations that gave you those slight variations, we literally wouldn't be here. Now, why is that? Uh, because the uh, hot spots and the cold spots represent variations not just in temperature, but in density. And in cosmology, there's only really one force that matters, it's gravitation. And gravitation is a pulling force. So if you have an over-dense region of the universe, it'll drag in material from the surroundings and enhance that density contrast. So the few parts per million back at the beginning uh, grew and grew and grew until they turned into something like this, uh, a universe with galaxies and clusters of galaxies uh, and within the galaxies, stars, and, and planets, and, uh, and on at least one, intelligent beings. So this growth of the large-scale structure that led to the universe we now see and permits the existence of life-bearing planets flows 
from the quantum activity in that first split second. Now, I keep saying split second. I, I'm actually talking about uh, something uh, a little bit, just a little bit longer than a trillion, trillion, trillionth of a second. So that's uh, the degree of co confidence that we can express in our theories that it's possible to actually model the universe at that ridiculously early time. Um, so now it does look like a case of uh, cosmic perfection. I'm describing to you a universe uh, that was born in almost uh, complete uniformity, uh, beautiful if you like, but with just the right degree of variation to lead to interesting things like uh, people. Uh, and, um, and there are some people that, that think that's it, that, that there must be a sort of principle uh, of uh, primordial simplicity or primordial perfection or something like that, because uh, we don't just live in any old universe. If the, if the Big Bang was any old bang, uh, it would be a total mess. Uh, it was a highly, highly orchestrated bang. Uh, and in addition to the um, uniformity of it, the bigness of the bang uh, is a re really very special because if the Big Bang had been smaller, the universe would have collapsed back on itself a long time ago. And if it had been bigger, the parts would have spread out so much that there would be no, none of this large-scale structure. Uh, and so it turns out, and this was known... Uh, uh, quite some decades, uh, that the rate of expansion matches the gravitating power of the universe almost precisely. And that mystery is explained by the inflation theory. So what we seem to have is something that you know, is very well set up. If you were going to make a universe, this is a pretty good one to make. Uh, but do you remember this picture? Well, down at the left-hand end here, uh, we see that there's... Uh, some discrepancies. Now that left hand end represents the largest angular scales. So what we're talking about is that the small scale variations match very well, but when you get to you know, that one over there, over there, um, it's not so good. And that led some people to wonder whether the universe is actually a botched job. Uh, a nice try of perfection, but, um, but it, uh, there's some flaws in it. Flo blemishes in an otherwise perfect universe. And uh, the what's eating the universe, I'll, you'll see how that uh, relates to this, but let me just show this picture. This is the same heat map of the sky. Um, and there are a couple of, there are a number of weird things, but a couple I'll just mention. One is that there's a um, slight lopsidedness between the hemispheres with the temperature. Uh, the other is that there's a curious cold patch in the constellation of Eridanus, which is in the southern hemisphere. We can't see it from here. Um, and it's... Uh, colder than it should be as that if it was just a random fluctuation uh, in the background heat radiation. Um, so what was that? Well, I'm going to suggest one idea in a moment. But um, uh, in order to, uh, to tackle problems of that sort and to get back to this big question, what happened before the Big Bang, uh, then we need to sort of enlarge the discussion a bit. Uh, and the point being that if the Big Bang... Uh, what if the Big Bang were not the ultimate origin of all physical things, not the beginning of space and time, as I've told you? Supposing uh, there was something there before it, um, not the universe we know and love, but not nothing anyway, uh, then uh, we would have a very different set of issues to address. And if the Big Bang was a natural event, and most scientists prefer to think of it as that and not a supernatural event, then it's very odd natural event that happens only once. So you might expect there to be bangs going off all the time, scattered throughout space and time. And so maybe our universe is, or the universe, what we call the universe, nothing of the sort. It's just our universe. It's just a microcosm in this much larger and more elaborate system, which has come to be known as the multiverse, the multiverse of many bubbles. Uh, and so the picture... I like to say the picture that is favoured among the type of people I have coffee with uh, is that our universe is just one bubble among many. Uh, uh, is this just the realm of science fiction? Well, some people think so, but it's not quite that because um, it's, it's one thing to just say, well, there are many big bangs, many bubbles, uh, and, and away you go. Um, there, there has been some effort to discuss universe generating mechanisms, that is, that the laws, there are laws of physics in this multiverse, and these laws can give rise to 
bubble universes, and that each universe, each bubble, would have a beginning, like a Big Bang, and they would evolve over a period of time and then maybe have an end as well. And so our universe is, you know, would, would have this life cycle. Uh, and then the inevitable question is, where are these other bubbles? And is there some way of uh, accessing them or knowing what, uh, what they're doing? Now, this question about the origin of, of the universe and the origin of, or of our universe and the origin of our bubbles, uh, bubble can't be disconnected from a deeper issue as one of the great unsolved problems of the universe, which is uh, where the laws of physics come from. It's all very well saying the laws of quantum mechanics permit a universe to pop into being from nothing, which I, I said earlier, um, but w did those laws of quantum physics somehow exist before the universe or outside the universe? How do we think about that? So again, when I was uh, you know, back in those uh, early days in uh, Cambridge, uh, the, the view was that the laws of physics were somehow imprinted on the universe uh, from the get-go, like the maker's mark. It's like a, you know, just like, like a hallmark. Boom, the, the, there are your laws, away you go. And then in the multiverse version, each one comes with its own set of laws. Um, and they'd be different. That's the hypothesis. Uh, and that they might well be randomly different, just sort of spread around um, uh, uh, d differently. So the laws that apply in our universe will be different in one of these other bubbles. Um, and uh, uh, the reason that that appeals to many cosmologists is because one of the oddities, one of the unexplained mysteries, cosmic mysteries about our universe, is that uh, it is uh, extraordinarily well suited for life, for the emergence of life. And let me explain that. Supposing you didn't like this universe and you wanted to play God and change a few things. And imagine you have a machine in front of you, like a designer machine with 30-something knobs, and you twiddle this one and all electrons get a bit heavier, and you twiddle that one and the weak nuclear force gets a bit weaker and so on. Um, well, we can't afford to do the real experiment, but you can do the thought experiment, you can do the calculation. And it's been known for a long time. It's actually Fred Hoyle who started this whole line of reasoning, that there are some things that look like if you twiddle the knob by only a tiny bit, it would be lethal. Uh, there would be no life, that the, there could be no possibility of life. And that uh, looks suspiciously like a universe that's sort of rigged in favor of life. Scientists don't like that idea. And so if there are many, many universes with randomly distributed laws, and just we're winners in a cosmic lottery, that here and there, um, just by chance, uh, the cosmic cookie would crumble in the appropriate manner and life would become possible. And here we are in ours, and it's no surprise that we, s we live in a universe that can support life. Obviously, we couldn't live in a sterile universe. Uh, and so that's uh, the sort of favored idea of the... Um, uh, of this uh, multiverse, why, uh, why it's uh, so appealing. Um, but uh, to get back to that uh, scar, that blemish in Eridanus, it's been suggested by Laura Messini Houghton, a, a cosmologist, that maybe this was a collision with another bubble, another bubble universe. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. There's one of the things that can happen in this multiverse model. Uh, if the Big Bang wasn't the ultimate beginning, uh, there's something uh, outside of our universe or before our universe, we have to take into account uh, those sorts of possibilities. Uh, so that brings me quite naturally to talk about uh, the end of the universe. Um, there are many, many things in this, uh, this book, I should say. I'm only giving you a subset. I'm trying to tie it together into a narrative. Uh, but let me say something about the end of the universe. So again, this sort of trip down memory lane, when I was a student, you had three choices. Um, either the universe would go on expanding, uh, and then it could uh, expand um, uh, so fast that basically everything would lose touch with everything else, or it would somehow reach a maximum size and collapse back on itself to a big crunch, like the Big Bang in reverse. And so this is the sort of big crunch idea. And then there would be this dividing line, this curve C, which was sort of exactly on the border. You couldn't really tell 
what the ultimate fate of the universe would be. And the observations really did suggest that we were sitting uh, on this dividing line, very frustrating, couldn't say uh, what, what it is. But the inflation theory explained that very nicely, that that's exactly where we should be sitting. Um, and so uh, uh, they had predicted that the universe would go on expanding, but at a decelerating rate and eventually become cold, dark, and empty, and really, really boring, and that would go on for all of eternity. Uh, and all this was transformed in the late 1990s when astronomers discovered to their consternation that the rate of expansion of the universe is actually speeding up, that it looks more like this, uh, with, uh, with this curve going up and up and up. Um, so uh, the reason it curves downwards, like this in the early stages, is because gravity is a pulling force, so it acts like a break as the universe expands. Um, but now, if it is going up and up and up, uh, that looks like uh, something uh, like anti-gravity, that looks like something very different. Uh, and that uh, leads me to talk about the dark forces of the cosmos. Um, if you uh, look at the at the cosmic pie, um, normal matter, that's the stuff that you, me, and the stars are made of, makes up only about 4% of what's out there. Uh, about five times as much as, as, of that, as that uh, is made up of some other form of matter. We don't know what it is. It's called dark matter, partly because we don't know what it is, but partly because it doesn't shine. Uh, and uh, this dark matter uh, could be uh, the favoured idea is that these are particles, uh, perhaps very heavy particles, maybe much heavier than the proton, uh, but interacting so weakly that they just pass straight through us. And if this is true, even as we're sitting here, uh, these uh, ghostly dark matter particles are just traversing our bodies uh, continuously and we don't feel a thing. It's sort of creepy sensation though, isn't it, to think it's going through us. But we know this is true of neutrinos. Neutrinos are incredibly penetrating particles that we can detect just about. They're very weakly interacting. They go straight through the Earth, you see. And they go straight through you as well. And just very occasionally you can stop one and study it. That's how we know they exist. So the plan is that the dark matter might be um, like uh, uh, neutrinos, much heavier, and that would make up uh, that. We know, we know it's there, this dark matter, because it exerts a gravitating effect. And part of the clustering that I showed you, the clumping together, is, uh, is due to the existence of the pull of that dark matter. So you can sort of measure, you can see it, it, uh, it, it pulling. So just for example, the Milky Way galaxy, the stars on the periphery are orbiting around much too fast for the amount of material we can see, the visible matter. It's got to be dark stuff. Uh, otherwise, it would unravel like an exploding flywheel. Uh, and so we know the dark matter is there. But uh, fully 75% of the stuff that is out there is not even that. It's called dark energy. And this is, causes confusion, you know, dark matter, dark energy. Dark is a word that astronomers like. Um, and uh, uh, it's and now, I've noticed, because uh, many years ago, Biologists said, oh, the physicists are so clever, they get a, there's a mystery, and they call it dark energy, dark matter, and so on. Uh, and we don't understand DNA, and we call it junk DNA. Well, I've now noticed they're starting to talk about dark DNA, so um, they've learned a trick or two. Now, uh, this uh, dark energy is what explains the accelerating uh, expansion of the universe. And this is an idea that goes right back to uh, Einstein, who gave us our best understanding of gravitation, space, and time. Uh, and he did that back in 1915 with his so-called general theory of relativity. It was a total triumph for the human intellect. A wonderful uh, uh, theory. And uh, right up to this day, uh, there is no known contradiction with the predictions of that theory, to the extent they can be measured. The most recent triumph uh, won't have escaped your attention, I'm sure, uh, was the discovery of gravitational waves predicted by this theory, predicted by Einstein over 100 years ago, and just recently discovered, opening up a whole new window on the universe, uh, gravitational astronomy, doing with gravitational waves what optical and radio telescopes do with electromagnetic waves. 
Uh, and so uh, the general theory of relativity is it uh, when it comes to describing the universe. And in 1917, uh, Einstein introduced uh, the idea of, which, of something we would now call dark energy. Uh, and he did this for all the wrong reasons. Uh, he thought the universe was static, and if it was static, why didn't it all fall down into a big heap? Uh, what was keeping all the galaxies or the stars out there uh, if everything was pulling on everything else? Newton worried about that as well, and that's a whole different story I don't have time to get into. But Einstein wanted to fix it up by inventing an anti-gravity force, uh, something like this. Uh, so uh, normal gravity diminishes with distance, like the famous inverse square law, uh, and Einstein said, in addition, there's this other thing that uh, gets bigger with distance, um, and that uh, you could balance the two. Uh, the uh, the anti-gravity force, you wouldn't notice much at short range, it's, it's, uh, it's not very strong, but over cosmic distances, it becomes big enough to rival the weight of the universe, and then you could hold the whole thing uh, static. Um, uh, well, it was much his chagrin later on when he went to the United States, met Hubble. He discovered the universe is actually expanding, and he realized that uh, this was uh, a blunder, uh, the worst blunder of his life, he said, uh, because had he not introduced this extra term in his prized field equations, then he would surely have concluded the universe must be expanding because it's not collapsing, or hasn't collapsed, um, but he missed the trick. Um, but uh, in spite of the fact Einstein introduced it for the wrong reason, turns out he was right all along. There is an anti-gravity force. Uh, whether it's just this term in his equation or something more subtle or some type of field, uh, we don't know. Uh, it does make a difference. But um, in case you're getting excited about anti-gravity, it's not much help uh, for this type of thing, I'm afraid, uh, because the total amount of force on a human being uh, 10 to the minus 26 uh, grams. Um, so uh, we don't notice it locally. Now, um, uh, what, so what then is this lambda term I've uh, uh, showed in the graph? What is this uh, anti-gravity? Uh, how do we think about it? Well, it is nothing more. It's very simple to think about. It's nothing more than the weight of empty space. Just that. How much does space itself weigh? And you might think, well, why should space weigh anything? Because there's nothing there. But as I've explained to you, there's... That's not true. There is something there. There's all this quantum activity going on. So how do you weigh space? Uh, how do you do that? You obviously can't put a box of space on, on a balance like, like I'm showing here. The only way you can actually weigh space, because it's everywhere, is in cosmology from the universe as a whole. And so astronomers can measure how fast the universe is expanding, how fast it's picking up in speed, and that gives you a number for the weight of space. Now, you might be thinking, well, hang on, hang on. Uh, if, if space has weight, shouldn't that contribute to gravity? Shouldn't that be a pulling force like everything else? And the answer is, uh, yes, that's true. But in addition to having energy, and E equals mt squared, so weight, energy, mass, weight, all are using them interchangeably. Um, in addition to that, there is pressure in Einstein's theory of Gravitation. Pressure is also a source of gravitation. We don't normally think of that. We, we think of the mass of the Earth keeping our feet on the ground. The pressure of the Earth, we think, doesn't contribute to that, but it does. It's a tiny amount, but it certainly does. And where you have a lot of pressure, uh, then uh, you have an enormous gravitational effect. Um, and in this particular way of introducing uh, this anti-gravity or dark energy, the pressure is negative. A negative means anti-gravity, and it outweighs the positive effect of the energy by a factor of three. So the net effect is to give you a repulsive force. And so the next slide just shows very, uh, in a pathetic way really, um, the idea of this quantum frolic. You have to look very carefully with particles that sort of flit in to and out of existence like that. Um, and then you can say, well, let's do a calculation to see how much energy or weight uh, is contained in that quantum vacuum. And I was talking earlier about this was just the sort of stuff Tim Bunch and I were doing back in the 70s. Uh, and it's easy enough. It takes uh, two minutes to sit down and uh, do a calculation. How much does all this vacuum, quantum vacuum stuff uh, end up weighing? 
Um, and when you do that, uh, well, what you find, first of all, what the astronomers measure is, to, just to give you a number, um, in a cube, 100,000 kilometers across. The total weight of space is about one gram. And when you go to the theory, uh, what you find is uh, the density is about 10 to the 90 grams per cubic centimeter. That's what the theory gives you. Um, whereas uh, expressed in those units, it's more like 10 to the minus 30. So this is um, a bit of a discrepancy. Stephen Hawking said it's the greatest failure of theory known to science. So if you try to deduce uh, from theoretical foundations uh, what this dark energy is, uh, that's, that's as far as you could get. So we're sort of stuck on that, and that's one of the great unsolved problems of cosmology. For any young people uh, listening to this lecture that are thinking of getting into the subject, there's plenty still to be done, and that's one of the outstanding questions. Now, um, to, to pick up the story of the end of the universe, I'm just trying to think when is the end of the lecture. I'm getting rather close to it. Um, uh, let me just say uh, that if the dark energy remains constant, then the universe will just go on expanding more and more and more uh, until it becomes dark, cold, and empty, but rather faster than it did in the old picture. But there's another alarming possibility. If the dark energy increases in its intensity, then the rate of expansion can go uh, literally through the roof. It can just uh, escalate until it becomes infinite. Uh, and at that point, space-time would cease to exist because it would be expanding infinitely fast. Uh, and that goes by the name of the Big Rip. Uh, and what it means is that the universe would end its days not in a crunch where everything collapses and space-time comes to an end uh, in a high-dense phase. This would be the opposite. It would be ripped apart. Um, of course, whether it really is the end, it's like what happened before the Big Bang. We don't know because we don't, uh, we're not confident enough in the application of, our, uh, of quantum physics to gravitation to be able to answer uh, what happens after the Big Rip or after the Big Crunch or before the Big Bang. There are many possibilities. Um, but um, uh, the, if the Big Rip's going to happen, it's not going to happen anytime soon. We're talking you know, billions and billions of years in the future. But meanwhile, uh, there are other things that can be happening uh, to accelerate the end of the universe. And uh, to pick up the, the title of the lecture, What's Eating the Universe, uh, I did uh, already mention the possibility of the cold spot in Eridanus being you know, something that had bumped into us. Is it possible our universe could be, uh, could be swallowed wholesale by another universe? And, uh, and is that something we should fret about? Um, so I've just got a list of you know, death by devourment here. Um, we know that un the universe is being eaten from the inside out by black holes. Black holes swallow everything that comes near them. Uh, and there are monster black holes at the centers of galaxies. Uh, and I'm talking about millions or billions of solar masses. Uh, and over time, these are swallowing prodigious amounts of material. So the universe is eating itself uh, from inside out, but it could be being eaten from outside in. It could be swallowed by another universe. Um, there's another horrible consequence that comes out of the physics I've been talking about, and it's the same thing as I've just been uh, discussing, this quantum vacuum. Uh, where, so uh, we're pretty confident that, the, uh, that empty space has this vacuum energy, but is it the lowest possible energy you can have? Is it conceivable that there is a state, a quantum state, with lower energy than the one that we have in our universe. And if that's so, uh, just like everything else in quantum mechanics, there's always a probability it can make a transition. Just like an excited atom, there's a probability it will de-excite and uh, emit energy. Uh, could the universe de-excite? Could it tunnel in some way into this lower energy quantum vacuum state? And if so, what would happen to the energy released? And the calculations suggest, it's been known for some decades, that this energy would be concentrated in like a shell wall uh, or a bubble wall. It's a bit another bubble. It's a bubble that would expand out of very close to the speed of light and, and basically devour the universe that we know, would swallow everything up and transform it, not into nothing, but into this um, uh, lower energy quantum state we can only guess at. Uh, and so that could happen at any time, you know, any time this bubble could arrive. And, 
uh, and would annihilate us faster than the speed of thought. Um, there's another really weird idea that goes back to uh, the work of Ed Witten in Princeton, uh, which is not that the universe would be, uh, be transformed by a bubble or swallowed by another universe, but it would be swallowed by bubbles of nothing, nothing at all. And I've been at pains to point out that there's a big difference between empty space and literally nothing. Uh, and we can imagine that uh, just like in the simple picture before the Big Bang there was nothing, in the multiverse there was something, but in the simple picture there was nothing, uh, maybe there are bubbles of nothing that can grow. So it's a bit like a Swiss cheese where the cheese is space and the holes are bubbles of nothing. And then it's as if the holes grow and grow and grow until there's no cheese left. Uh, that's, that's another possibility that's discussed. Um, and it's not that, I mean, there are many other ways uh, that the universe in its present condition could fail. Space-time itself, many physicists think that space-time is not a primitive entity. It's not the, you know, one of these ultimate things that, you, that goes into making a universe. It might itself be an emergent uh, feature. It might be something that comes out of some sort of pre-space-time or pre-geometry, something like that. And it maybe is you know, being held in a state of equilibrium, but if something destabilized it, space-time itself could, uh, could collapse. Um, I, I think I have, we started like a minute late, I just want to uh, raise, but not address in detail, because we can deal with it in question time, raise. Uh, the other big question that uh, I've been very much associated with, um, are we alone in the universe? Uh, is there any life out there, any intelligent life? I mentioned at the beginning about uh, canals and Mars. We don't take that seriously, but we must be open to the possibility that there's not just life, but maybe intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. I'm actually personally very skeptical of it, but I think it's a really important question to ask. And there's an entire field called SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, started by Frank Drake, the astronomer, in uh, 1960, addressing this question, is anybody out there? And the reason I think that we find that very hard to answer, and I'm out of step with my colleagues on this one, Frank wrote down this equation, it's called the Drake Equation, uh, with all the terms you need to know to estimate the number of communicating civilizations in the Milky Way at this time. And if you look at that equation, the first uh, one is the, uh, uh, the um, rate of star formation, and then the next one is the fraction of stars with planets, and then the next term is the number of planets that are Earth-like. And those things, when Frank wrote this down, those things weren't known very well, but we now know them rather precisely, so uh, that is uh, fine. But then we hit a term uh, where we don't know what to say, because F sub L is the fraction of Earth-like planets on which life emerges. And uh, when I was a student, it, uh, the uh, prevailing view was that number would be exceedingly small, that life is so complex, uh, that uh, so specific, that it would require a dream run of chemical reactions uh, for it to happen, and that the chances of that dream run happening anywhere else in the universe were infinitesimal. Francis Crick summed it up. He said, uh, life seems almost a miracle, so many are the conditions necessary for it to get going. So this is the big problem. How did life begin? Was it a bizarre fluke? Is it somehow built into the nature? Is the universe rigged in favor of life? Is it built into the nature of chemistry and physics? We don't know. Um, uh, Darwin himself uh, uh, said, uh, it's a wonderful quote, it's mere rubbish uh, thinking at the present time the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. And i always fond of saying, well, we physicists have now explained the origin of matter, but we haven't explained the origin of life. And if you don't know what turned non-life into life, you can't work out the betting odds. You can't work out the probability it's going to happen. So we're absolutely stuck. The universe might be teeming with life, uh, but it might be that we are the only planet with life, which is very sad. I'd love to believe there's life out there, but we don't know. Um, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. I've got um, a lovely quote here by uh, Alfred Wallace. He was Darwin's you know, uh, rival, uh, came up with the theory of relativity, and he wrote a book about... Uh, called Man's Place in the Universe in 1904. Um, and he, he was also of the view the improbabilities of the independent development of man, sort of quaint and politically incorrect terminology, I apologize for his words, not mine, um, even in, on, in one other world, are now shown to be so great as to approach very closely the actually 
impossible. Um, I, uh, having run out of time, I'm going to just skip over Jacques Manot and uh, uh, Christian de Duve's uh, notion on this um, and just uh, say that I regard the biggest of the big questions as uh, the fact that the universe is comprehensible, the fact that we can even come to understand it uh, by applying this wonderful thing called uh, science and mathematics, uh, that the human intellect is able to make sense of the world through the scientific endeavor. Uh, and, and this is, I think, uh, really important. I said that the, uh, some people like the multiverse idea because uh, it explains why our universe looks so friendly for life, uh, because that's what we observe. But we're more than observers. Uh, Einstein being a classic example that we don't just see the world around us, we've come to comprehend it. Uh, and Einstein felt that that was the most incomprehensible thing about the universe, that we can comprehend it. And I agree with that. And I began with a quote uh, from Michael Faraday, so I'm going to leave with a quote from Michael Faraday. Uh, it's rather nice. He says, lectures which really teach will never be popular. Lectures which are popular will never really teach. Well, I hope this evening I've given you something which is a bit of both. I hope it's been an enjoyable experience, but I hope you've actually learned something, and I'm very happy to move on and take questions. So thank you.